Well, hi, my name is Pat Salmon. I'm a Staten Island historian, retired curator of history. And I'm here today at the Noble Maritime Collection to speak about things that were made on the Kill Van Cull. Uh, the Kill Van Cull is, of course, um, the body of water that runs on the north side of Staten Island. It empties into the New York Harbor on the east side, and then it goes and flows to the Arthur Kill on the west side. It's always been an important waterway. I mean, going, going back to the time of the Lenape even, um, there were, uh, various, what we could even call ferry landings that the Lenape used to go back and forth to New Jersey. So it was always an important transportation location. And when Europeans arrived on the island, they started to settle at various points along the Kill Van Cull on the north shore of Staten Island. Um, we see sparse settlements in the 1700s. Uh, we see a section of Richmond Terrace actually developed between Elm Park and what was referred to as Holland Hook. Today we call it Howland Hook. It's actually, uh, the name has been corrupted from the original Holland Hook though. But um, originally uh, Richmond Terrace was known as the Shore Trail or the Shore Road. And um, everything really changed with the arrival of the Industrial Revolution in the United States. Um, all kinds of technological innovations and inventions, and, and, and people started leaving the farms and going to find jobs in industrial plants. And the first time we see this occur is around 1818. And of course, we first see it occurring on the Kill Van Cull because this river location allows factory owners to ship out goods, receive raw materials, uh, send their salespeople out, send factory visitors in. So, you know, we, we see the, the river playing a major role in many industrial uh, manufactories on the Kill Van Cull. And as a matter of fact, all of the factories that developed on Staten Island were on some, some area of, of waterfront so that they could have these opportunities. But it was around 1818 that we see five industrialists buy a piece of property at what we now call Richmond Terrace and Broadway. And they set up a company that dyed various materials, satin, camel, uh, camel hair, plushes, silks, cotton, linens. They also cleaned materials such as carpets, blankets, uh, linen, and cotton, and they were quite successful. As a matter of fact, by 1824, they were incorporated, and it, the company was known as the New York Dyeing and Printing Establishment. It was, as I said, located on what we now call Broadway and Richmond Terrace, but it also had usage of the other side of what is now Richmond Terrace. In other words, there was a ferry landing there. There was a pier there. So they took advantage of that to move their goods out of, out of the company, out of the factory. Early on, this company employed about 100 to 150 workers, and it actually became the center of a village that became known as the Factory Village. Um, it was the first large manufacturing center on Staten Island. As a matter of fact, by 1835, this one company was worth almost a million dollars. We see a dispute about 1850 between the owners of the company, who were the, the Barretts, was the last name of the family that owns the company at this time, and one of their nephews. And the nephew breaks off, and he forms his own dyeing and printing establishment up on what we now call Forest Avenue by... Barrett Avenue in the Port Richmond Center of Staten Island. Meanwhile, the factory that was still operating at Broadway and Richmond Terrace was, was moving right along, doing really well. But then the 1890s brought a slowdown. So what happened was uh, the people who owned the company on Richmond Terrace, they bought the company in Port Richmond, they merged the companies, and they started back up again at full throttle on the Richmond Terrace and Broadway. So this was a very important location. Uh, keep in mind now that in 1886, a man by the name of Erastus Wyman 
was working with uh, the North Shore Ferry Company on Staten Island and the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. And he was able to open up a North Shore Railroad on Staten Island. And this North Shore Railroad was now also working in conjunction with the waterfront uh, opportunities to move goods out, to bring goods in, to move workers, to move visitors. It was, it was a win-win situation, having the railroad and the waterfront. Pretty much, it even came to where the, where the railroad, railroad ran from around Old Place, which is where the Gothels Bridge is now, all the way to St. George, where it hooked up with Staten Island's East Shore Ferry. But back to Factoryville, back to the area where um, the Barrett Di New York Dying and Printing Establishment was located. What we see happening here is very typical of locations where there was factories. A village started to spring up. It was uh, all kinds of things. You know, butchers came in, uh, banks came in, insurance companies came in. But in the case of the workers and the workers' housing, we see where the owners of the factories build workers' housing. They build one and two family houses. They build small apartment buildings. They set up a factory store where the factory workers are kind of uh, obligated to buy their goods and, and uh, flour, tobacco, and things of that nature. For the housing, they rent this housing from the factory owner. So they become very financially dependent on the factory owner. This was sometimes viewed as paternalistic. But others view it as a, as a way for the factory owners to control the workers. And we've seen this on other locations on Staten Island, other locations in, in the United States, of course. But we also see it at uh, Clifton with the, with the Bachman Brewery. We see it at Chrysleyville with the Chrysler Brickworks. You know, we see it um, in um, Travis when the linoleum factory was operating. So it was not an unusual thing. Um, even by the 1830s, believe it or not, a company uh, that was owned by Charles Goodyear was opened up, and it was a, fa a factory that actually manufactured rubber, rubber raincoats and things like that. And of course, you recognize the name Goodyear. This leads to Goodyear Tires, a company which is still in business today. Not on Staten Island, but still in business today nonetheless. And around 1830, we also see a man by the name of John Crabtree coming from England to work at the New York Dying and Printing Establishment. Um, boy, he was a real go-getter, you know, real self-starter. Well, he went out 18 years later and opened his own company. And he produced, along with the workers, silk handkerchiefs and colorful bandanas. And he was very, very successful. This company was on Jersey Street in New Brighton, again, right near the waterfront, right near access to the railroad and to the, the waterfront location where he could ship his goods out and get the raw materials in. Now get this, in 1855, Crabtree employed 90 men, three women, 60 boys, 30 girls for 183 workers. So you have 90 children working at this factory. So that was sort of another downside and dark side of these factories in the, in the 1800s. They all, with the exception of the breweries on Staten Island, hired children. Children weren't expected to go to school so much as they were expected to go to work and help support the family. In any event, um, the Crabtree Company operated until the 1870s. Something else fascinating happened on Staten Island around 1837 or so. We see the Staten Island National Bank, which is run by a man by the name of Richard Littell. We see him opening up a whaling company of all things. And um, if you know where Park Avenue is in Port Richmond and where it comes into Richmond Terrace, well, on the water side of what is now Richmond Terrace, that's exactly where the Staten Island Whaling Company was located. Believe it or not, there was a, a, a bark, which is a, a name for a three-masted vessel, a bark called the White Oak would sail you know, away from the, the whale processing plants at Port Richmond. 
And the captain, whose name was William Barney, would actually go to the, the cold waters of the Arctic to harvest whales. And sometimes he went to the warmer waters off to Tahiti and New Zealand to also harvest whales. And he would bring them back to the island, to Staten Island location, in order to process the oils, which, as you know, was very, 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 very valuable back in the 1830s, the 1840s. Unfortunately, the whaling company didn't last. It was in business for about five years or so. And it was replaced by the Jewett White Lead Company around 1842. They originally, this company was started by John Jewett uh, about 1828 in Saugerties, New York. But um, he decided to move it to Staten Island. And they opened up also on, on, the, on the shore road at Port Richmond on the water side. Eventually, they took over land on uh, the south side of Richmond Terrace where the Seduto ice cream plant used to be. So they had a huge piece of property there. And it was between Jewett Avenue, pretty much, and Port Richmond Avenue. Took up a lot of area there. They used the Dutch process to manufacture white lead. You know white lead better as paint. So this is what they were doing, you know, through the early 1900s at that location. And of course, we now know that that process of using the lead in the paint has caused numerous environmental and medical problems for various people over the years. But um, anyway, John's sons, George, uh, Charles, and Olive, Olive, Oliver, uh, helped him in the business, and they officially joined the business. Um, and it became uh, so well known that the Jewett white lead paint was known throughout the country. They usually had about 100 men working at the factory, and they were capable around 1886 of turning out 3,500 tons of white lead paint annually. And according to their advertisement, the quality and purity of which are not surpassed. In 1888, the Jewett White Lead Company was actually taken over by the National Lead Company. This was the makers of Dutch boy paints, but they decided to keep the Jewett White Lead name because it was so well known throughout the country. Um, by 1904, this is the largest white lead factory not in the United States, but in the world. Um, it, it was just an amazing place, and and the, the you know, the Jewett family, as you know, went on to become very well known on Staten Island. They actually were some of the founders of the Unitarian Church that we know today. There was some problems with the, um, one of the members of the family, Orville, he was the secretary of the company. And around uh, 1877, he got very upset with his brothers. So he went to the Jewett office in Manhattan. And I should tell you that most of these companies that manufactured on Staten Island also had Manhattan offices because that's where the main focus of business was back in the 1800s. So it might, uh, you know, even though the waterfront was a great location for manufacturing, it was that much easier to meet with uh, potential, you know, customers and things in Manhattan. Plus, I have my own feeling that having a Manhattan address was, you know, probably thought of as being, uh, you know, a little more showy or something like that. In any event, Orville got very upset with his uncle and his brother, um, and they were upset with him. He was, it seems, spending a lot of money, uh, spending a lot of time on his yacht, spending a lot of time at the, at the racetrack, and they didn't think Orville was pulling his weight with the company, so they tried to buy him out so that, you know, they sort of trying to buy him out so they could push him out. And he got really upset about this. So on April 9th, 1877, he went up to the Manhattan office and he actually took a hand grenade and he threw it, a live hand grenade, in the office. It killed his uncle and it actually hurt him. Um, and he died a few days later. So there was, you know, there was a, a lot of problems uh, with this uh, situation with the Jewett family. Interestingly, 
that Jewett location in later years, in the 1900s, about 1953 to 1972, that became the site of Wise Glass Stadium. And everybody always likes to talk about Wise Glass Stadium. If they're old enough to remember it, uh, there was you know, a track there where NASGAR sanctioned automobile races actually took place. And you know, the Wise Glass family, who we know so well from their military products that they they made during the 1900s um, sponsored the stadium and it was a very popular location not just for the uh, the race cars but there was also baseball games football games uh, racing circus performances wrestling matches it was a very very popular location um, now, going back to the Jewetts, the Jewetts were also involved with a factory called the Dean Linseed Company. And that operated a few miles up the road, uh, say a little west of the Jewett White Lead Company. And um, linseed oil at this time was used as a drying agent for paint and varnishes. So the two companies, they fit together very well. Um, it too turned out to be one of the largest concerns of its kind in the United States. And they even shipped their linseed oil as far as South Africa, the Caribbean, Australia, and throughout the United States. Now, many of the companies on Staten Island, many of the factories, the workers were unionized. So we do see union problems in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Well, in 1903, the Dean Linseed um, workers were on strike, and they attacked a, a group of scabs that were going into the factory with clubs and with stones. And it seems that the what was called the, the pressers, the people who actually pressed the flaxseed to make the linseed oil, uh, were on strike because the owners wanted them to do seven presses a day, but they said they could only do six presses a day safely. Anyway, uh, the police arrived on the scene, drove the, the, the striking workers away. A strange little place, this Dean linseed oil. In 1911, lightning struck the building and it struck it with such force that the slate roof was actually blown off the factory and blown right into the Kilvan Cull. Pretty wild, don't you think? Now, the population of Staten Island, of course, grew and grew and grew. Uh, so it was only about 7,000 people here in um, 1830. By 1860, we see about 26,000 people. Uh, there's a great influx in the 1840s of Irish people escaping the famine, the great hunger in Ireland. 1850s, we see a big movement of German people coming from Germany. And many of them are coming to Staten Island because we have all these uh, factories on the Kilvan Cull that are looking for good employers. And so, and as I said before, once they started moving to the North Shore, you see an increased need for bakers and, and, and butchers and candlestick makers, so to speak. So, you know, we see the North Shore population going up, up, up. Now, one thing Staten Island was always known for, and initially on a small scale, was shipbuilding. Shipbuilding, you know, they used the oak trees that grew on the island, uh, there were always many of them, to build wooden ships. Well, in the early 1900s, we see shipbuilding exploding on Staten Island. Um, even go back to 1902 at a company called Townsend Downies. It's on Shooter's Island, and they have gotten a contract to make Kaiser Wilhelm's yacht and they did and they launched it in 1902 on february 25th and get this i mean president theodore roosevelt even attended with his daughter the kaiser wasn't there but he did send his brother uh to to, to represent him for this this great event now with the onset of World War I in 1914, we really see, start to see shipbuilding you know, activity really uh, exploding on the island. Now, as you know, uh, the United States was not 
involved in the war until 1918, but by not even but even early on, we were still supplying many many ships for those that were at war in Europe. Um, as a matter of fact, by the end of the war, by 1920, there were 18 shipyards or repair plants on Staten Island, and they employed about 7,000 people. Four of these yards alone, listen to this, produced 39 freight steamers, three tankers, three refrigerator ships, two freight and passenger vessels, four 1,000-ton coal barges, and two floating sectional dry docks, in addition to, to building scows, lighters, and other small boats. A company known as Millikan Brothers Structural Steel and Iron Works was originally uh, located on Staten Island. Um, by 1903, they had a huge plant out by Howland Hook. Um, it, it was on both sides of Richmond Terrace, and it was between Holland Avenue and Western Avenue, as a matter of fact. fact, They were connected to the rail lines out there that ran off the Arlington Yards, and of course they had access to the waterfront to ship out their goods and bring raw materials in. Uh, Millikan did not last very long, unfortunately. 1917 saw Downey shipbuilding moving, and you know what's interesting to know is that this was very difficult work, and it was very dangerous work. Uh, there was a lot of explosions and fires and welding accidents and things like that. In fact, the Millican plant actually had their own on-site hospital with a doctor and a few nurses round the clock for when people uh, you know, had problems and got injured. So they didn't have to sh send the person over to Staten Island Hospital way down in you know, New Brighton area. In any event, in 1917, we see Downey Shipbuilding operating where the Townsend, uh, excuse me, the Millican brothers had once operated. Now, when Wallace Downey announced that he was opening his new plant uh, at this site, this is what he said. He said it in an, a huge advertisement in the Sun newspaper uh, back in that time. He said, quote, a large steel shipbuilding department with six shipbuilding berths will be promptly installed at this waterfront steel fabricating plant. He said that by 1918, in one year, they would have 12 standardized steamships built each weighing 7,500 net tons. Now, this was already April of 1917, and he's saying that, oh, what, in eight months or something, we're going to, you know, be putting out these 12 huge ships. And he actually did, because when I checked the newspapers, he was, he was good for his word. Downey Shipbuilding hired thousands and thousands of people, but it didn't last long. They were only in business till about 1927. And at that time, interestingly enough, a company called the Balanca Aeroplane Corporation opened up on the property. It seems that an Italian immigrant by the name of Giuseppe Balanca, um, he was only about 26 years old, he set up this aeroplane company and even he had a staff of 60 men, he got orders worth $300,000 to manufacture airplanes. And this is, as I said, um, you know, it, it, it was about 1927, so this was, you know, people were just wild about airplanes. So his business grew by leaps and bounds, so much so that it wasn't long before he had to leave Staten Island because he needed more space. Now, this, as I said, this shipbuilding is, uh, it's, it's like keeping track of chess pieces on, on a board in the 1920s and the 1930s. There's a many of them on this North Shore of Staten Island, and, and it seems like they're constantly being taken over, and they're moving their headquarters to one part of Richmond Terrace, another part of Richmond Terrace. So bear with me while I tell you a little bit about these shipping companies. 1928, we see the Brewer Dry Dock Company. It's operating on Richmond Terrace. It's employing 200 men. In the future, this same Brewer Dry Dock would hire as many as 1,000 men to work at the site. In fact, in the 1930s alone, they built 10 barges 
for the Department of Sanitation. Uh, they, during World War II, they were building and converting and repairing ships on the Kilvan Cull. Um, and as you can imagine, these shipyards that operated, they not only employed Staten Islanders, but there were many people would come over from New Jersey to work in these shipyards too. Uh, by the 1960s, Brewers was still in business and they were mainly repairing ships. They were still in business by the mid 1970s, in fact. Shooter's Island, that little island you see when you're on the Bayonne Bridge, um, they had a number of shipyards working on that site. In 1907, Shooter's Island Shipyard was active. They would even have a, a ferry operating by Richmond Terrace and Van Pelt Avenue for the workers to go to so that they could board the ferry and be taken over to Shooter's Island from work. Um, uh, Burley was a very big company and they also owned uh, many other properties along the Richmond Terrace during the, the 1900s. Interestingly, Burley manufactured the first Staten Island ferry that was operated by the city of New York. Back in 1904, when the city took over you know, municipal ferry service, they ordered five new ferry boats, and they were called the borough class of boats. I guess the Staten Island shipyards weren't big enough to manufacture all five, so Burley manufactured the Richmond, which obviously was named after Staten Island. The other four were manufactured by the Maryland Steel Company, and of course those other four were called the Brooklyn, the Queens, the Bronx, the Manhattan. But the, all five of the boats were launched on October 25th, 1905. And of course, they were said to be a little stiff when they took off. And, and there was even a report that the Richmond um, broke down for about 45 minutes out in the harbor. But eh, 45 minutes, I guess, wasn't too bad. And they got it going again, and there were very few problems after that. Uh, by 1930, Burley is closed down. By World War II, though, we see that the Bethlehem Steel Company was receiving all kinds of contracts from the U.S. government, the Navy in particular, for the construction of ships. They were also converting and repairing warships. So Bethlehem Steel Corporation employed thousands of workers on Staten Island during World War II. After the war, uh, steel barges and harbor craft were still built at the site. But by the late 1940s, again, we see Staten Island ferries in, uh, in construction on the waterfront on the Kilvan Cull. We see the Merrill class of boats being built by the Bethlehem Steel Company. Uh, Private First Class Joseph F. Merrill was uh, constructed at uh, Bethlehem Steel Corporation, as was the Verrazano, with two R's and two Z's, and the Cornelius Kalf boat. Those three ships were all manufactured on Staten Island. E you know, even before that, uh, there was a, a Staten Island ferry called the President Roosevelt. It was built at Staten Island Shipbuilding Company, and it was launched around 1921 in Mariner's Harbor. Uh, the American Legion, the first American Legion, was built around 1905 on Staten Island at the Staten Island Shipbuilding Company. Um, so we see all of these Staten Island ferries being constructed over the years. Uh, the Gold Star Mother was manufactured on Staten Island, as was its two sister ships, the Miss New York and the Mary Murray. They were all manufactured on Staten Island. Ships, uh, whaling companies, white lead paint, all kinds of things are being made on Staten Island. But I guess one of the things that's pretty fascinating is that Hecker's flower brand, which we all know, was one time processed on Staten Island. The, pro the company went into business around 1842, and they had a, comp uh, a man excuse me, they had a processing plant on uh, Cherry Street in Manhattan. And eventually, the company expanded so much so that they opened a mill on Staten Island sometime before 1898. 
It was on the water side of the Kill Van Cull in Mariner's Harbor, opposite Bush Avenue, and it had one of the longest piers that was ever built on Staten Island. Um, strange to say, but it, the company was gone by 1900, although the mill was still active. It seemed that it was taken over by another company, and um, there seems to have been a flower trust uh, going on. In other words, the flower companies were accused of trying to create monopolies, so they were broken up. And um, so, you know, we see all, all kinds of uh, management changes, shall we say, occurring with this, with this flour mill that operated on Staten Island. Oh my goodness, the Standard Varnish Company was another big company here on Staten Island. Um, they, they moved to Staten Island from Long Island in 1892. By 1907, they're operating on the Kill Van Cull between Granite Avenue and Houseman Avenue on both sides of Richmond Terrace. And this is more or less the Elm Park section of Staten Island. They too had access to the rail lines, not just the waterfront, but they had the rail lines coming. As a matter of fact, uh, the rail line went right through their company and that made everything that much easier. You didn't have to move anything if the train was pulling in right onto, all right, onto your property. In 1928, excuse me, 1924, Standard Varnish is taken over by a company called Tuck Chemicals. And even, even four years later though, they're still calling it the Standard Varnish Company. Not far from here at all, not far from the Noble Maritime Collection, there was, around 1876, a company opened up by J. Bear King. He established the Windsor Plaster Mills, opposite Franklin Avenue on the Kill Van Cull, um, right on the waterfront there, and it, it made it easy for the company to receive the raw material of gypsum rock, which was sent to them from their quarries in Nova Scotia. And they uh, created uh, a number of different products uh, for, for actually for a number of years, all kinds of wall board and, and gypsum uh, rock and stuff, it's not rock, but uh, gypsum walls and things like that. Um, very, very big company. Unfortunately, this company was known for a number of tragedies. They hired a lot of young people. You know, they had two boys working at the factory in 1901. And I guess on their lunch break, the boys decided they were going to go for a swim. Unfortunately, one of the boys could not swim. And when he called to the other boy for some help, when the boy went to help him, the two of them sort of like grabbed onto each other and just sank to the bottom. Very sad, and then, you know, sad to think they weren't in school, you know, at that time. But December 3rd, 1901, we see a huge fire completely destroying J.B. King's company. And there were 300 people working in the ferry at that time. Four days later, the, the fire was still smoldering and the coroner wanted it put out because seven people were missing and he was wanting to get into the remains of the factory to see if perhaps the bodies were in the building. Oh, it was uh, very sad. Um, and then on April 26, 1913, the owner, J.B. King, actually committed suicide. So it is a lot of sadness involved with that, with that one, little, one large factory. Um, it wasn't very long after his death that uh, J.B. King Windsor uh, Plaster Mills was taken over by United States Gypsum. And this company, it's alone expanded in one of the, into one of the biggest companies on Staten Island. They were organized in Chicago in 1901. They had about 46 plants across the United States. And it was a, a place where they always had the latest equipment, the, the latest, you know, uh, uh, machinery was always coming in. Um, in the early years, 1926, a new automatic wallboard plant was erected to replace the old burdensome method of producing wallboard. And, you know, it was, uh, they started making paste products and, and other products to help people, you know, build. As a matter of fact, historian James Ferrari believes that if, if you bought a house on Staten Island at the end of you know, World War II, 
perhaps up to the 1970s, there's a good chance that the house you bought, you lived in, was made with some uh, materials that were made by the U.S. Gypsum Company and probably on Staten Island. Now, by the 1970s, uh, gypsum is saying, you know, we're kind of confined by this factory that we have here. It's small. We don't have room for our trucks on Richmond Terrace. After the Verrazano Bridge opened, taxes went up for a lot of these, these companies. Uh, the real estate that they were on, the price of that was going up. So U.S. Gypsum made the decision that they were going to move to New Jersey. And they actually had plants already at Kearney, South Plainfield, and Clark, New Jersey. And today, as you know, on that property, we see the Atlantic Salt Company. Now, the, the last manufacturer I'll tell you about is Procter & Gamble. Procter & Gamble started in Cincinnati around 1837. You know, they manufactured ivory soap in the 1870s, and ivory soap became the rage by anyone who wanted to use a modern soap. And then when they found out that it floated by accident, well, even more people wanted to use it, and the sales went through the roof. Around 1900, the company bought a num uh, about 77 acres down in the Howland Hook section of Staten Island, and they opened a plant around 1905 or so. They named it in honor of the legendary ivory soap, and they called it Port Ivory. The site was in full swing by 1907. Uh, ivory soap, Lennox soap, uh, Duncan Hines cake mix, even orange juice was, uh, was manufactured at the plant. Different detergents, both, you know, liquid, flakes, uh, powders, all these things were, were made at this one site. Um, by 1926, they had expanded to 129 acres. They had over 1,000 employees. And as many of us know, if you had a job at Procter & Gamble, you had a good job. You know, you had great benefits, great retirement. It was a wonderful company to work for. But, you know, by the 1970s, again, Procter & Gamble's plant is outdated. The property prices have gone up. The taxes have gone up after the opening of the Verrazano Bridge. They didn't want to modernize the old plant. So they decided to close that plant. Bethlehem Steel closed about 1972. Um, and the, the list goes on, but you know, not all of these plants left a positive uh, legacy upon the environment. So um, without going into details about that at this current time, I always like to direct people to a website called ToxicTrailMap.com. It was researched and put together by Deborah Davis, who's a works on Staten Island, has a, a company for uh, doing graphic design and such. Well, she did so much research on the uh, lasting effects that these companies left on the, on the environment. Uh, it's amazing, and I always like to tell people, check it out, uh, toxictrailmap.com. Today, we still have, on the Kilvan Co., we have Moran Towing Corporation, we have Cadell Dry Dock, the Atlantic Salt Company, and, and many others. So there is a still a living, breathing, working environment on Staten Island. I'd like to remind you that um, Noble Maritime Collection has created a, a number of videos, and you're invited to go watch these videos. They're part of the Noble on Watch series. Just go to noblemaritime.org slash N-O-W, and you'll be able to check them out. Thanks so much.